This is a farm in China. This is a McDonald's in New York. This is an apartment complex in Mumbai. And this is a skyscraper in London. What do all of these things have in common? Well, as it turns out, all of these places' successes or failures, economic booms or collapses, and even population explosions or famines might soon be decided by the nation of Morocco. But probably not for the reasons that you might think. In fact, this future economic trajectory was likely decided by a tiny little creature just a couple centuries ago. This is a bat. In the modern world, we view bats as things that both control insect populations, as well as creatures that spread rare diseases. But a few hundred years ago, bats were discovered to do something else. Something miraculous that would shape our world forever without most people realizing it. In 1802, the European explorer Alexander von Humboldt was traveling through the Peruvian lands when he discovered something strange. You see, the Peruvian lands did not seem like they were suitable for large-scale agriculture, yet the Peruvian fields were filled with lush and healthy-looking crops and he soon discovered that the Peruvian people had been collecting a substance called guano, which is the excretion of bats and some seabirds, and they were using this by spreading it along their crops for the previous several thousand years. So, Alexander von Humboldt ended up bringing this knowledge of guano significantly increasing food production back to Europe, where soon that knowledge would become a key point of interest to the Western world. Because soon after the discovery of guano, food production boomed in the United States and Europe. And all of a sudden, these Western nations went from having a small but significant shortage of food to having a massive surplus of food, which was more than enough to feed all of its citizens and then some. In fact, guano's impact on boosting food production became so important that several wars were fought over guano, such as the Chincha Islands War, War of 1864 and the War of the Pacific in 1879. The United States actually became so enamored with guano that it passed the Guano Islands Act, which allowed any American citizen to claim and annex any island that had any substantial amount of guano on it. And well, they did lay claim to roughly 70 of these islands most of which were in the Pacific Ocean. Now you see, guano became so important to the economic population and industrial growth of the Western world that it arguably became the most vital resource in the entire world. However, in 1913, Fritz Haber would discover a way to synthesize an artificial version of guano that we today call fertilizer. And it was this one event, the discovery of a fertilizer, that would go on to be known as the detonator for the population explosion of the world. Soon after, starvation in nations that used fertilizer became rare. The world's population grew from 1.6 billion to 7.7 billion over the next 100 years. Food production and crop yields immediately doubled in many areas that used fertilizer. Nations with typically unsuitable locations to grow food, like northern European countries such as Norway, all of a sudden were able to sustainably grow crops in more areas. And well, eventually every single country's economic and population growth was indirectly caused by the food surplus created from fertilizer. In fact, it is estimated that roughly 50% of all nitrogen in your body is directly from fertilizer that farms use to grow food. And well, that brings us to today. All of this seems great so far. Fertilizer has allowed many countries to grow and in some cases become superpowers of the world where nearly all of their citizens are well fed and have a very little food insecurity. But in 2010, a few scientists began to notice something a little bit worrying. Fertilizer, the compound responsible for a ton of the growth that humanity has seen over the last two centuries might actually be running out. That's because that our fertilizer that has been used to grow our entire civilization over the last couple hundred years 
needs three things. One of which is a nitrogen-based compound, the second of which is a phosphate, and the third of which is a potassium-based compound. And two of these are compounds that we cannot create from scratch. And those compounds are phosphate and potassium, or in its raw form, potash. You see, potash is a non-renewable resource that is largely controlled by just four countries. Canada is by far the world's largest producer of potash, with over one-third of the world's potash coming from Canada. Russia, Belarus, and China produce between 10 and 20% of the world's potash each, and every other nation in the world combined produces only about 19% of the world's potash. And let's think about that for a second. Essentially, four countries control one ingredient that will dictate who is or isn't allowed to produce fertilizer. And because potash resources are being depleted in these countries, potash will become a more valuable resource as the world's population continues to grow and the food requirements for the world also grow. Now, the world isn't likely going to go through a potash shortage in the next hundred years or so. In fact, our potash reserves could last for several hundred years before we see any shortages. However, phosphate, one of those three key ingredients, is a completely different case. You see, since 2010, there's been a hotly contested debate about when, not if, the world will run out of rock phosphate. The United States Geological Survey estimated that we currently have 260 years worth of phosphate left in the Earth, assuming that the population doesn't grow at all. And assuming the population continues to grow at a similar rate at what it is today, we have roughly just over 100 years of phosphate left in the Earth. However, those are just estimates. That number could be much lower or much higher. But really, we don't even need to know when the world will run out of phosphate because we are already seeing shortages. And also, we are seeing countries take drastic economic policies to protect their own phosphate. For example, phosphate prices have increased by roughly 80% since early 2020. In September of 2021, China banned exporting of any of its own phosphate in hopes of assuring that it had enough phosphate to produce enough fertilizer to grow its own food for the foreseeable future. But there is one key aspect that I have left out until this point, and that is this. You see, China has the second largest phosphate reserves in the world, as it owns roughly 5% of the world's phosphate. And keep in mind, that is second on this list, and it is already concerned about its phosphate supply. Syria has the third largest amount of phosphate at 3%, Algeria is next at just under 3%, and the rest of the world has only 2% or less each per country in terms of the world's phosphate reserves. But then, at number one, there is the country of Morocco. You see, Morocco owns a whopping 70% of the world's phosphate. And let's think about that for a second. One nation owns 70% of a resource that can dictate which other nations will be able to feed their populations. In fact, within the next several decades, the world's food supply could become dependent upon whoever Morocco chooses to trade with or who they choose not to trade with. Or maybe, just simply, Morocco will just sell off the phosphate to the highest bidder. There is also the potential for international conflict or cooperation as that has been seen throughout history with any valuable resource. And this would be far from the first time that we have seen wars started or partnerships enacted that revolved around the acquisition of fertilizer. In fact, increasingly every single year, large populous countries like India, Mexico, and Brazil are becoming even more reliant upon Moroccan phosphate or their agricultural industries. And other nations like the United States have been placing tariffs on Moroccan phosphate and going in the other direction. Now, it is worth mentioning that peak phosphorus 
as some are calling this predicament, may not occur as soon as we think. As mentioned earlier, estimates range from seeing significant shortages relatively soon to seeing shortages that occur in several hundred years from now. But this peak phosphorus mentality is actually quite similar to what people were saying about oil in the 1950s. Because back then, many scientists assumed that oil production and reserves would peak around the year 1970. Yet since then, the world has discovered substantially more oil in places like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Norway, Iran, and China. There was also technological innovations for oil, like fracking, which allowed the extraction of oil in deposits that were previously seen as unextractable because of how difficult it was to, well, extract the oil. All this means is that even though it is predicted that rock phosphates will become significantly depleted over the next several decades, we can't really know for sure. Also, scientists have begun genetically engineering plants to absorb significantly more phosphorus in natural soil to try and avoid the reliance on fertilizer. And so far, those experiments have been minor successes. But at the end of the day, the entire world might be for its fertilizer, something that has never been seen before in the history of the world. All of those old superpowers that owned a large percentage of the world's resources, like the United States had with oil over 100 years ago, the British Empire had with metals in the early 19th century, the Dutch East India Company of the 1600s, or the Hudson's Bay Company in the late 1600s, all of those monopolies could pale in comparison comparison to Morocco's monopoly on phosphate and the world's fertilizer. It is also worth noting that part of Morocco's phosphate reserves are currently in an occupation zone in the Western Sahara, meaning that a lot of those deposits are already in a conflict zone, which could be a sign of things to come.